Thank you. Um, let me just make sure it can work this. Yep. Um, so, th yes, thank you. And thank you, Heather, for inviting me to contribute to today. Okay, so my paper is Sloan's Legacy and Left Wing Artists of the Depression Era. So, we're looking to the future in some ways. Um, the Ashcan label hung on the challenge the group of New York artists, sorry, New York realists, presented to academic idealism, the advocating of French Beaux Arts formula and a belief in culture's edifying potential. Motivated by rebellion against these priorities and the class that sustained them, Ashcan artists developed an iconography that engaged with people who existed on the social margins. All the seedy glory of the rapidly growing metropolis was captured in sombre colours, coarse brushstrokes and unconventional compositional arrangements that were interpreted by contemporaries, not just as expressions of raw energy uh, appropriate to the gritty urban content, but as emotional and political responses engendered by the inadequacies of the societies they captured in paint. Their realist aesthetic had a political undercurrent. Insurgents, anarchists, socialists, all opponents of any form of government. That was the assessment of the New York Sun. Their ostensibly uncensored vision of the city made no pretense at objectivity. Indeed, a salient characteristic of Ashcan painting is the seemingly casual formal qualities through which the artist declares, this is how I see this. Pivotal in cementing the left-leaning associations was a relationship with the masses, a monthly magazine of art, literature, politics and science, which ran from 1911 to 1917. The masses was born of the same radical Greenwich Village subculture that nurtured the Ashcan School. Indeed, William Glackens, Robert Henry, George Bellows and John Sloan all submitted images, although the degree of involvement markedly different. Glackens contributed only one drawing, whereas Sloan, as we know, is the founder of the publication and art editor for five years. The masses was never an official Socialist Party organ. But following Max Eastman's arrival as editor in December 1912, its sympathy towards the party's far left articulating support for the most divisive issues of the day, including industrial unionism and direct action, were very obvious. Okay, so the focus on this paper is the fertile ground that this Ashcan masses imagery offered the next generation of artists, artists seeking codes for social commentary. This area of study has largely been overlooked, not least because of the relative obscurity of the artists involved, but also because the political interests of members of the Ashcan group have been veiled on occasion um, by critics, by historians, and by the artists themselves. It's a shared concept of realism that uh, ties a Depression era artist to the older generation, one rooted in a belief that depicting contemporary realities contributed in some way to human advancement. For both groups to be socially progressive was to come down on the side of the political left. Although, of course, the political, like the cultural framework, had shifted appreciably in a relatively short period of time. Nonetheless, idiomatic and iconographic similarities abound between the, uh, sorry, the Ashcan masses over and the art of Louis Lozowick, Nikolai Sikowski, Harry Sternberg, Joseph Beale, Philip Reisman, and Raphael Moses and Isaac Sawyer, just to name a few. Mm. Those are in the wrong order. Okay. As ideologue and as teacher to the Ashcan artists and numerous um, masses contributors, including Morris Becker, Robert Minor, Kenneth Russell Chamberlain, and Stuart Davis, Henry, of course, was central to the emerging critical practice. He encouraged a form of realism that presented, as he said, ideas of value, arguing that the purpose of art was to make a statement. To quote him, men who have achieved great art felt the tremendous need of raising their voices for or against the condition of life that existed. His, his sympathetic attitude towards the ordinary model, as he said, that was a fascinating manifest manifestation of life, unsurprisingly attracted those of a radical bent. Henry's students developed a distinctive idiom, uh, utilising coarse, grainy, rough-hewn crayon lines that powerfully communicated the human face of the political struggle. 
Now, whilst Henry was, uh, uh, it, whilst Henry's influence as mentor and theoretician is substantial, it was not much by his practical achievements. His art uh, was weighted by 19th century naturalistic convention, and many of his students emerged from his shadow, Sloane amongst them. Sloane's energetic, unrefined style is unmatched by Henry. He made greater strides against, sorry, away from established formats, partly, I believe, due to his graphic art practice. Unlike other members of the Ashcan School, the subject matter of Sloane's work, certainly after his move to New York and pre-1916, when he left the masses, overwhelmingly focuses on the working classes. Among these images are those that transcend the arm's length narratives that are routine to the group. Uh, works such as Pigeons, which I saw earlier, and McSorley's Bar, which is coming up, um, exhibit a level of comprehension about the working class experience that find equivalence in the masses by Sloan, such as this one, um, Bachelor Girl, and by other artists, such as Morris Becker, Harbingers of Spring, we'll see in a minute, and Cornelia Barnes's 1230. The masses featured images that ranged from journalistic illustrations, figure studies, realist drawings, political propaganda, cartoons, and caricatures. It held enormous appeal for artists, offering access to a wide audience and freedom to experiment in style and subject. This freedom blurred boundaries between art and politics. In August 1911, Sloan articulated a distinction between his political cartoons and proper art when he informed the editor of Coming Nation, when propaganda enters my drawings, it's politics, not art. However, Sloan's aesthetic position is not as rigid as this statement suggests, and its formulation is complex. Fed by cultural de debates between socialist and anarchist politics that point to different conclusions about the relationship between art and politics. In 1910, Sloan and wife Dolly were active members of the Socialist Party, campaigning, joining committees, distributing literature. Sloan ran as party candidate for state assembly from 1911 to 1913, and then for a judgeship a year later. He offered his talents freely to the socialist cause, contributing to a number of um, cartoons, sorry, a number of cartoons and drawings to a range of periodicals. So a couple of examples here. In the pages of his diary, he articulated the belief that capitalism was detrimental to creativity, writing, no man could do good work and not be a socialist. He also said that involvement with the movement, the socialist movement, to quote him, surely is better than to paint pandering pictures to please the ignorant, listless money class of the USA. So despite his, free, um, his struggle to marry different aspects of his practice, politics evidently affected his views on art. As the most, political, sorry, as the most politically active member of the Ashgang group, as the producer of a substantial body of works focused on social and political commentary and criticism in paint and print, Sloan stands out as the significant artist of the early development of a left-wing aesthetic and a viable precedent for the critical realism practiced during the Depression era. Beale, Evergood, Ryback, Reisman, Sternberg, and Raphael Sawyer studied at the Art Students League, where all of the, um, all of the Ashcan group, Bar Glackens, were employed as teachers at one time or another, um, along, along with a number of masses artists, actually. Sloan taught at the League intermittently between 1916 and 38, and briefly became president between 1931 and 32. His instructive text, Just of Art, was compiled from notes made by League students between 1927 and 1938, um, and his ideas, along with Henry's, of course, compiled into the art spirit, permeated the League. Sloan encouraged students to go into the streets and look at life. His advice was, quote, keep your mind on such deep-seated truths in reality, and there is no room for the superficial. The formal characteristics employed by the younger generation of artists reference Ashcan painting to varying degrees. They also reference masses and liberator imagery. 
A mutually beneficial exchange between fine and graphic art remained a contributing factor to aesthetic development throughout the pages of the Masses' Descendants, the Liberator, which was published between 1918 and 24, and the New Masses between 26 and 48. The formal elements were understood as an index of socially concerned realist art, and in, and in union with the focus on the working classes, the artists were engaged in a critical iconology. A comparison of Sloane's recruiting un Union Square to Sawyer's in the City Park reveal a number of continuities. Both scenes are depicted as if casual, casually happened upon. Feet protruding to Sloane's picture, people chat amongst themselves, exit the park uh, with their back to the artist. The officer's bearing displays confidence, his gloved hands tucked tightly into the belt of his uniform. The labourer with a wrench clasped behind his back adopts a casual pose, as if kind of minimal interest in the conversation. Every time I look at this image, I think about what it would look like as a sketch and how comfortably it would fit into the masses. You can just imagine it with a pithy one-liner, just fit right in. Um, and poor men line the surrounding benches, sticking, as Sloane observed in his diary, to the freedom of their poverty. While gravitating towards gritty content, Ashkan art frequently simultaneously exudes energy uh, through the Bavaria application and through the volume of incident contained in scenes such as this one. An enviable proletarian vitality that is not apparent in the social realist paintings. They did not duplicate Ashkan practice. Rather, they maintained its discomforting edge by reinflecting urban realism with pathos suited to the altered social and economic political and political climate of the 1930s. Sawyer's lower class city square inhabitants appear anything but free. Their experience of the depression weighs heavily on their faces. The colours are cold, the brushstroke, uh, the brushstroke emotive but not exuberant. The asymmetric composition draws the viewer's attention to the group of destitute men huddled on the park bench one so poor, he rests on his possessions tied up in brown paper and string. Positioning them in close to the far right creates an emptiness that contrasts with Sloane's busy composition. Union Square, an area long associated with the labour movement, is easily identified by the equestrian statue of George Washington that faces in the opposite direction of the vacant gaze of the central men in the foreground. The father of the country has his back to the men. Others line the outskirts of the square, some talking, some sleeping. None but the newspaper seller, the only working male pictured, notices the two women that stroll past. The painting attests to the emasculating experience of unemployment. Like Sloane, Sawyer lived and worked among the people he pictured. He produced many images of dispossessed men that demonstrate compassionate involvement. He wrote, I painted what I knew and what I saw around me, many pictures of the unemployed, of homeless men, because I saw them everywhere, in parks, on sidewalks, sleeping on girders of abandoned construction sites. I sympathised with them, identified with them. Here, his subject's proximity to the picture plane creates intimacy with the viewer that renders vivid the boredom and despair they're experiencing. Of the Ashkan artists, Sloane consistently created the most respectful representations of the working classes. While he avoided stereotyping and tended towards more personalised interactions between subject and audience, as in McSorley's Bar, an image of camaraderie where we observe, I feel, like a patron rather than a voyeur, um, Sloane never blurred boundaries with portraiture in the way that Sawyer does. Identification with the lower classes is one of the traits that distinguishes social realism from the spectrum of realisms being practiced in the 30s and is largely rooted in the backgrounds and politics of the artists involved. Ryback, Reisman, Beale, Sternberg and the Sawyer brothers all emigrated to New York as children or were first generation citizens, all lived for some point of time on the Lower East Side of New York and all, along with Sikorsky, had some involvement with far left politics. Um, and its cultural sphere during the late 20s and 30s, either with the New Masses or the John Reed Club, which was organised by the American Communist Party as a functioning centre of proletarian culture, 
or by the Artists' Union, which was born of the John Reed Club. And all of these artists signed the Call for the American Artists' Congress, which was a popular front initiative. As noted, Harbinger of Spring is an example of the vital but sensitive depictions of um, inequality that can be found in the masses. Becker, who shared Sloane's politics, but whose background had more in common with the social realists, is the most consistent amongst the periodicals collaborators in achieving this. Um, here, I think the decision to crop at the waist and the elbow and place the vendor close to the picture plane creates an intimacy that emanates uh, comedy, it, rather than inviting scrutiny and assessment. Um, it's a device that the Sawyers employed frequently to the same end. Moses Sawyer, Raphael's twin brother, uh, who attended Sunday night critiques led by Henry at the Ferreira School, recalled the impact the masses and the liberator had on the brothers. To quote him, we fell in love with their work. These artists dealt with everyday common people and with their humble, hard lives. We liked the frank, bias attitude of the artists. They were not afraid to moralise. Ashcan influence is evident in Reisman's urban vignettes. In the Bowery, men congregate on the, street, uh, on the street with no specific purpose. The location and the subject, particularly the amputees in the foreground, remind us of the hardships of life. But nothing in the compositions suggests protests or att uh, attempts to elicit sympathy. With their backs to the viewer, preoccupied with their own activity, the men convey unity and dignity. Reisman said of his work, I have tried to paint the things as they are, and I am satisfied with things as they are. They are destructive to the individual, to his sense of security. Ultimately, they are destructive to civilization. It is inevitable that some of that feeling should go into my painting. A large number of socialists. Uh, a large number of social realist images, sorry, uh, focused unsurprisingly on the unemployed, predominantly men. One notable strain of shared interest with the Ashcan art, uh, sorry, with Ashcan art, is the city as a contested space. Zuria and Snyder's Metropolitan Lives details the Ashcan engagement with working class appropriation of urban space for diverse use, evident in paintings such as Bellows' 42 Kids. In Ryback's east side New York, the lower class is also comedy in the slum area, at the edge of the river for leisure purposes. The children play war with toy swords and guns in the shadow of industrial squalor. Um, people dive off the dock or sit and watch the activity. The painting's grey hue gives a sense that everything's being rubbed down in certain grime. The factory smokestacks, the large cynical towers of the gas depot that form the backdrop, partially masked by the filthy smoke of a passing barge, painted in the same colour as the river. Beals on the shore, along the shoreline, Raphael's The Unemployed and Sikovsky's on the East River all represent New York as a multitude of public areas that lack defined function. Beals down and outs grouped together on a rooftop of a derelict building, presumably a preferable makeshift bed than the pavement. Um, its formal similarities with the 1916 Masses illustration are noteworthy. Sikovsky's On the East River depicts vagrant males in the soft edge forms that recall the Masses' style. Um, like Sawyer's The Mission, it featured in the new Masses, although it's unlikely that either print were made specifically for that end. Sikovsky's Unemployed, while their time away at the docks, a place where casual work was sought, although these men are not active. One slumps, head rested on hand, the other sleeps on a makeshift bed of uh, lifestyle magazines, emphasising the misery of poverty. The men have the same sunken faces and forlorn expressions um, as the majority of those that consume bread and coffee in Sawyer's Mission House. Sikovsky serves as a good example of a belief in the continued potency of the Ashcan realist aesthetic. He did not come under the tutelage of Henry or his students, although he did briefly teach at the Art Students League. He emigrated to the USA in 1923, aged 29, from Russia, where he had produced experimental art, which in his words, frightened the Russian people. 
When he moved to America, he continued working in a cubistic idiom, but during the 1930s, he practiced social realism, a choice motivated by his political commitments. It was Sikovsky that introduced Raphael Sawyer to the John Reed Club. Reisman remembered the John Reed Club as a good education, and Sawyer believed that his involvement raised his class consciousness and gave his painting psychological depth. Although he stated, quote, I did not paint so-called class conscious pictures. Like Sloan, he differentiated between political imagery and proper art. Nevertheless, the realist practices of both are informed by awareness of the concerns of the contemporary left. Unlike the pre-1917 left, the Communist Party provided some theoretical discourse, scant though this was. New Masses was pivotal in maintaining contact with Russian cultural entities from 1930 onwards. However, Soviet directives were ambiguous and changeable, and largely viewed as inapplicable to American political and cultural situation by party members and fellow travellers. And the few exhibitions of Soviet art held in the US from the mid-20s to the 30s received virtually no coverage in the communist press at all. The social realism viewed here exposed the failings of capitalism in very human terms, in an idiom familiar and transparently comprehensible to its audience. Yet the work fell short of expectation by many far-left critics. The daily workers swiped um, at the quote, meek and worried attitude exhibited by Sikovsky's um, tear-jerking question mark pictures of park bench scenes and garbage can dramas. And a new masses review acknowledged the poignancy of, quote, the tragic spectacle captured by Raphael Sawyer, but stated, this group of canvases cannot be said to constitute a healthy tendency in revolutionary painting. This is partly an issue of style. Um, the presence of European modernism was keenly felt in communist culture, cultural circles, particularly German expressionism, evident in the work of Den, the influence of George Gross particularly. Um, in later years, Sawyer himself expressed doubts about the potency of his naturalism, um, of his naturalistic social realism, stating when faced with the powerful imagery of Gross, quote, I became so dissatisfied with the mildness, the sympathy, the unexaggeratedness of my art. More problematic, however, was the view. Let's go back to the, sorry. More problematic, however, was the view that the works presented a passive record of immediate phenomenon with no solution. With no dialectic of historic change, the situation was presented as a given. While these empathetic images did not realise the aesthetic aims of all communists, it is worth noting um, that they proved equally problematic for conservative critics. An art news review of, Whitney's, of the Whitney's 1935 American genre exhibition bemoaned as inappropriate quote, canvas after canvas of the unemployed group tragically in Union Square and the Bowery. And the question of the aptitude of contemporary artists at creating, quote, earnestly 100% American genre painting of subjects, and the subjects suggested were a steady rhythm of American bourgeois life, or alternatively, Indians, hillbillies, and spiritual singing Negroes in a comparative state of picturesque innocence. Yeah. While for some communist critics, Sikovsky's and Sawyer's social realism constituted a rearguard action, as one review put it, new masses chose to illustrate the prints, as they did a number of urban uh, scenes in the Ashcan vein, regardless of the lack of explicit political content, such as these here by um, Gropper and Sternberg. Gropper, I think, is another artist very much engaged with Ashcan, um, the Ashcan aesthetic, but... <laughs> His work is various, and that's the subject of another lecture, really. Um, as, as, a key, as key theorist Lewis Lozowick wrote in, the, in Art Front in 1936, the formation of a revolutionary art is the task to be achieved by, not by one work or even one artist. It is the labour of a movement. Support was voiced for social realism, or for the social realism discussed here. A new masses review just described Ryback's home relief station as an excellent example of the transition of contemporary painting from static recording to active social criticism. 
Ryback's engagement with cartoon simplicity, with types and with expressive idioms that pushed his art beyond the realm of naturalism found favour with the left. And critic Elizabeth McCausland stated of Reisman's work, what is wonderful about Reisman is that there is no element of pity. It protests rather one thinks more implicitly than directly. The Ashkan Masses dialogue engendered a realism that elevated the status of the labourer, of independent working class women, of recent immigrants. It registered the urban space of one as stratified by race and class in a manner found discomforting to the respectable bourgeois purview. The choices explored by artists such as Sloan, Bellows and Becker proved a productive model for the next generation of artists whose aims Sternberg effectively summarised in, in his 1936 article for Prince magazine which asked, isn't it supposed to be the function of the artist to help form and improve the society in which he lives? When seeking an aesthetic that carried political sympathies, many social realists engaged with Ashkan artists and acknowledging that genealogy acknowledges the confrontational content of much Ashkan realism. Thank you.